The Dead Sea, the lowest point on planet Earth once described as a well-watered plain like the Garden of the Lord. Nearly 4,000 years ago, the crust of the earth split open and out of its bowels belched fire and brimstone that rained down upon the cities of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim. Abraham stood in the door of his tent on the other side of these mountains and watched as the cities and their inhabitants were incinerated in the inferno. The Jordan River continues to wash minerals from the highlands of Israel into this dead-end chasm. And what appeared to be distant, nondescript rock formations out in the middle of the sun-parched Israeli desert turns out to be the ashen remains of the cities of the plain, found still standing and covered with millions of chunks of brimstone. I'm Michael Rood. Prepare for a rude awakening. In the book of Genesis, we read that God instructed Abraham to leave the land of Babylon and its perverted system of sun god worship. The Almighty had already confused the languages and scattered the inhabitants of Babylon to slow down the development of Nimrod's political, economic, and religious world government system. The worship of Nimrod's son, Tammuz, the reincarnated sun god, and the worship of Nimrod's wife, reincarnated as Ishtar, were both fragmented into divergent cults at the Tower of Babel. For thousands of years, religiously motivated military campaigns kept these once unified peoples from joining forces to rebuild the one world government that Nimrod had begun. Raised in the land of Shinar, Abraham was instructed to leave Babylon behind, crossing over the Euphrates River into a land that God would give his descendants. Abraham became the first Hebrew, Hebrew meaning to cross over, when he crossed over the Euphrates, leaving Babylonian paganism far behind. The Hebrew scriptures from Genesis to Revelation clearly define God's intention to purge pagan sun god worship from the land promised Abraham and then from the entire earth. The Creator has determined the purpose of life, and He states emphatically how He does and does not wish to be worshipped. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Babylon bringing his nephew Lot and their families with him. Upon entering the land, Lot joined himself to a prosperous culture that had developed on this then fertile plain. Lot took up residence in the city of Sodom. The prophet Ezekiel said that the sin of Sodom was pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness. She did not strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty and committed abominations. <laughs> Sorry for this rude interruption, but if you want to know how to get on the bad side of the Almighty, search the scriptures for what God calls an abomination. The word abomination is translated from the harshest words in the Hebrew language, tova and sheketz, and they mean perverted, disgusting, repulsive, sick, putrid, vile, you get the picture. <laughs> Their self-indulgent lifestyle led to a perversion named after the city, sodomy, commonly known today as homosexuality. Abraham was forewarned that the sin of Sodom might have reached the point that divine intervention was required. Two angels, who appeared as men, left Abraham's tent to see what was transpiring in the city of Sodom. Upon arrival, the angels were welcomed into the home of Lot, but an aroused group of homosexual men demanded that Lot send these strangers out to them so that they could rape them. Lot refused, so they attacked him on his front porch. The angels pulled Lot to safety inside the house and smote the entire mob with blindness. The scriptures record that they wore themselves out as they groped the house looking for the door. At sunrise, the angels took Lot his wife and two daughters by the hands dragging them away from the city. Soon, fire and brimstone rained down from heaven, turning the city into a raging inferno. That is when some scientists believed that the 3,000-mile Great Rift Valley was formed, when the earth's crust fractured and belched fire and brimstone into the heavens. 
As the brimstone showered down upon the cities, Abraham saw the smoke of Sodom rise up in the distance. But until the smoke cleared, Abraham had no idea that Lot was saved from destruction. The buildings, streets, and walkways throughout the land of Israel are constructed primarily of what is commonly referred to as Jerusalem stone. Like the walls of the ancient city of Jerusalem behind me, a calcium rock which is as abundant in Israel as stray cats in the old city, and if you've ever been here, you know what I mean. The inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah would no doubt have taken advantage of this most common building material for their homes, palaces, and fortress walls just as is used throughout the land today. Archaeologists contribute Sodom and Gomorrah's overt wealth to the flourishing vegetation and the commercial value of the asphalt pits found in this once lush valley. Asphalt, oozing from deep in the earth, turns this wadi into a surreal landscape. The builders of the cities on this plain had access to an unlimited supply of asphalt with which to cement their buildings into indestructible fortresses. Indestructible until burning brimstone rained from the sky, igniting the asphalt mortar and turning the city into a furnace. Calcium plus sulfur plus fire yields gypsum ash, and that is exactly what remains of these cities. These structures appear as rock formations from a distance, but those who venture out into this deserted, lion-prowled wasteland soon find their trek to become laborious as they sink ankle-deep in this gypsum ash. When this ash is subjected to flame, it does not even change color. It has already been completely consumed. Substances burned with sulfur can have a higher remaining ash weight than the original substance. That may explain, in part, how this sphinx-shaped object and others like them can remain standing throughout the centuries. The layers of ash, twisted and warped by the intense heat, finally settle into a form that much resembles the original object. The minimal rainfall on this desert contributes to the longevity of these structures, slowly compacting the layers of ash through the centuries. A 90 degree angle rarely occurs in nature, a phenomenon that we diligently search for when looking for a man-made artifact. And on this plateau, we observe two identical elongated pyramids, which highlight the grand entry into the temple site here at Gomorrah. They are identical in length, width, height, and angle of incline, an impossible combination for a naturally occurring rock formation. The entire area surrounding Gomorrah is rock. These are the mountains of Judea, and we are standing on the remains of Herod's mountain fortress of Masada. At its base are the stone cordon encampments of the Roman army that besieged the Jewish zealots who were barricaded on this mountain after the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 of the Common Era. The Romans encamped on the gravel bed of this surrounding plain. But the city of Gomorrah, beyond these encampments, is unique in its structure and composition. Walls, buildings, and temple structures reminiscent of the ancient temples of Babylon are preserved as heavy gypsum ash. Moses referred to the condition of this area by saying, The Lord overthrew Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, and Zeboim in his anger and wrath. The whole land is brimstone and salt and ashes. It is not sown nor bears fruit, nor grows any grass.
desert gazelle scrap a meager menu from the stubble that grows from the bottom of the wadis. Dry riverbeds that are occasionally flooded by rainwater cascading from the Judean mountains. The gazelles scour the wadis in search of vegetation, but occasionally paw the ash on the plateaus to find a nutritious treat. This is a natural mineral salt lick, the salt of which Moses spoke. Mineral salts from the bodies of the incinerated citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah continue to leach to the surface even after 4,000 years. After the atomic bombs were dropped that ended World War II in the Pacific, U.S. military inspectors at Hiroshima found piles of white powder near the blast site. Analysis proved the powder to be the mineral salts of the incinerated individuals who were vaporized in the fireball. All that was left was a pile of salt. That discovery and the salt licks of Sodom and Gomorrah may answer the question, what became of Lot's wife? The scriptures indicate she turned back to the doomed city and became not a literal pillar, but in the Hebrew, a memorial of salt. All that's left of her and the entire population is the mineral salts which the desert gazelle now eat. No! In recent centuries, legend has developed that the four cities of the plain were submerged in the briny depths at the south end of the Dead Sea. Yet 500 years after the event, Moses recorded that the cities remain as brimstone, salt, and ashes. In the first century of the Common Era, Shimon Kepha, commonly known as Simon Peter, spoke of the remains of the cities as if it were common knowledge among the Jews of his day. In the second century, the Jewish priest and historian Josephus spoke of their remains still standing in the Judean desert. The Dead Sea has continued to recede since the days that the scriptures were penned, and if they were visible in the days of Josephus, there is no way that they could now be submerged. Through the years, many looked in the wrong places and found nothing. But the cities of the plain were discovered exactly where the scriptures indicate, along the western shore of the Salt Sea and the Dead Sea Valley Plain. In the book of Genesis, we read, Before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, even as the garden of the Lord. We also read that the kings of the land of Shinar made war with the kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Abma, Zeboim, and Zoar. All of their armies were gathered together to fight in the Valley of Sodom, which after the destruction of those cities is now called the Salt Sea. The location of the four cities is cited in the scripture when describing the borders of the land of the Canaanites, which was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Gaza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma, and Zeboim, even unto Lasha. The four cities could only form the border of the Canaanites if they were spread out along the Jordan River Valley and not grouped together at the south end of what is now called the Dead Sea. In the first book of Shemuel, we read, The Philistines camped at Michmas, and raiding parties went out from the camp in three detachments. One turned toward Ophrah in the vicinity of Shual, another toward Beth Horan, and the third toward the border of the land overlooking the valley of Zeboim, facing the desert. 
Again, the location of the remains of Zeboim is north of the Dead Sea and is designated as facing the desert in the Great Rift Valley east of Michmas. These four locations have yielded the same ashen features and brimstone remains that we see here in the city of Gomorrah. The brimstone found here is unique to this part of the earth. Samples have been analyzed in laboratories in the U.S. and also in one of the most prestigious laboratories in the world, the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, which awards the Nobel Prize in the field of science. Critical analysis show this sulfur to be 95.72% pure sulfur with three other trace metals which could generate sufficient heat to melt even stainless steel. Several years ago, I spent an entire week camped out under the stars here in the city of Gomorrah. I'd heard that an archaeologist in the early 1800s had found this site and reported its location. In 1989, another archaeologist stumbled onto this site while working in the area. When I was introduced to the evidence, I was compelled to make a journey to this desert. Trudging my way through the ash by the light of the full moon, I crusted an ashen incline onto this moonlit plateau. Pale yellow balls of sulfur, exposed by a recent fall rain, were perched on the surrounding ash. I crushed one between my fingers and inhaled. This was the reason that I journeyed over 8,000 miles as a skeptic. I had to see and smell this testimony for myself. I returned to Jerusalem a week later with a suitcase full of brimstone. Finding friends in the old city, I related my adventure to a growing audience who was eager to see if brimstone would still burn after 4,000 years in the desert. Touching a match to a small piece, it immediately became a black oozing mass with a purple flame. We began to choke and gag as the hot sulfur dioxide fumes seared our lungs. We evacuated the building and got the brimstone out of the building onto the street where it burned itself out. And that was the last time that I lit brimstone indoors. But I did learn a valuable lesson. Being unable to breathe in the presence of the poisonous gases emitted from the brimstone, the inhabitants of the cities would have been rendered unconscious. They would have died a relatively painless death before their bodies and diseases were cleansed in the fire. Even in judgment, our Creator is merciful. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Because um, they couldn't find any, um, any faithful men, any godly men. People were doing evil. Lust, city full of lust. The sinfulness of them had reached his nostrils in heaven. Was that right? <laughs> they sinned in a way that we shouldn't sin. Stealing, hurting each other. I have no idea. Because they were having all those sex orgies, I just told you. You name it, whatever they had back then. He got angry, sin, disobedient, worship, worshiping other gods. I find fascinating parallels in the history of Sodom and Gomorrah and that of our current culture, especially in the United States. The document, which has become commonly known in America as the Declaration of Independence, recognizes that the Creator has endowed every human being with absolute rights that no civil or religious entity has the right to alienate from the individual. The public school system in the United States was originally established to teach children how to read the Bible so that they could never be stripped of their God-given rights. For the past several generations, however, the Department of Re-Education in Washington, D.C. has forced the once independent schools to teach that life is just the result of millions of years of aberrant chance mutations in a purely mechanical universe, and there is no creator. The nice sterile term for this is evolution. But if there is no creator, then there are no creator-given rights upon which our republic was founded. 
Without God-given rights, we are left with only government-given rights. And what the government giveth, the government taketh away. If there is no creator, we have neither God-given rights nor God-given responsibilities. There is no right or wrong. And we, like all animals, are reduced to survival of the fittest. And if it feels good, do it. Sodom and Gomorrah's kings promoted the same prosperity-driven, lawless lifestyle. In Shimon Kepha's second letter to the followers of Yahshua of Nazareth, known by many today as Jesus, Kepha writes, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into ashes, making them an ensample to those that live ungodly lives. <laughs> Rudimentary explanation. The word ensample in the Greek language means a visible example, something that can be witnessed in the physical universe not theological speculation. Just as surely as the Almighty does not rain fire and brimstone down on every generation or city in which there's gross wickedness, He has left a testimony in the earth for these last days. God is the righteous judge, and if you decide to live an ungodly life, your judgment is just as sure as the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. The remains of Sodom and Gomorrah are also a testimony to the righteous. Lot remained righteous in the midst of a sick, twisted, and perverse world. God delivered the righteous in the day of his judgment then, and he will deliver the just as he shakes the earth in these last days. Many people have a very negative attitude concerning the judgment of God falling on a nation. Well, it depends on whether you are in the wrong or whether you have been wronged. When one gets his day in court and righteous judgment is handed down from the bench, those who have been wronged celebrate. They have been vindicated and will be compensated. Those who have wronged others are punished. That is righteous judgment. God's judgment on Sodom brought relief to those who were shackled in dungeons until they were abused to death. It ended the rape and murder of other men who had entered into the city expecting to conduct business and then return to their wives and children, only to be defiled mercilessly before being bludgeoned to death. It ended child pornography and sex slave markets. It ended kidnapping and prostitution rings. It ended the murder of babies conceived in the free sex atmosphere of Sodom's singles bars, church dating clubs, and the private studies of lawless clergy. Perhaps it ended the first syphilis and AIDS epidemics that would have wiped out the world before the age of modern medicine. God is the righteous judge, and if you are living a righteous lifestyle, you long for the day that His righteous judgment is released upon the face of the earth. As it is written in the Psalms, the righteous speak of His judgment all the day long. But as I say, His judgment is not pleasant table conversation in the house of the wicked. As Shimon Kepha said, even though we do not see God's hand of judgment overtly revealed against the wicked, do not deceive yourself into thinking that the Almighty is slack concerning His promise of judgment. He is not. He is long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. He never judges without fair warning. Consider this fair warning. The day, the millennium of the Lord, is at hand. Just as Kepha prophesied, the remains of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah stand as an ensample, a visible witness in the last days. A witness that the Hebrew Scriptures are an accurate historical record of the land and people of which they speak. The ashen remains of those cities are a testimony to those who decide to live an ungodly life. They remind us that the judge, though long-suffering, will render a swift and terrible verdict to those who disobey his commandments 
and do their own thing. This brimstone is an aromatic reminder that the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov is the righteous judge, and that he will deliver the righteous in the day of judgment. I'm Michael Rood. Join us again next time for A Rood Awakening, and I'll see you when the smoke clears.